to Talk to Internal Audit, our dedicated Facebook Live series. Today's session is about mental health and well-being, the challenge that is facing us all to a greater or lesser extent as we continue to work remotely, often with little or no social interaction throughout the day. So grab a tea, take a seat and join me as we delve into today's session. But before we start, may I just introduce myself to those that don't know me. I'm Liz Sandwith and I'm the Chief Professional Practice Advisor at the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors UK and Ireland. The Institute is the only professional body dedicated exclusively to training, supporting and representing internal auditors in the UK and Ireland. We have approximately 10,000 members across all sectors uh, of the economy in all parts of the UK and Ireland. And our members are part of a global network of some 200,000 members in 170 countries, all working to the same international standards and code of ethics. May I also remind you that you can acquire CPE points for these Talk to Internal Audit sessions. So don't forget to log them using our CPE template. Details of how to claim CPE from this live session can be found in the comments section. So, as I mentioned, today's topic is mental health and well-being, the challenges we are all facing. Stevie Spring, the CEO of Mind, spoke at our conference in September last year, as some of you may remember, and shared some quite alarming statistics. For example, one in four suffer a mental health issue every year. One in 12 suffer a severe and enduring condition. One in 10 children and young people have a diagnosable condition. There are 6,000 plus suicides per year in England and 3,000 people with long-term mental health problems lose their jobs each year. But organizations that support staff mental health also gain some competitive advantages because employees feel valued, engaged, better able to cope. There's improved staff morale, productivity and loyalty and improved employee engagement, performance and hence profitability. So has COVID-19 had an impact? According to Stevie Spring, 43% had rarely or not felt relaxed. 60% said their mental health had deteriorated and 34% described their mental health as currently poor or very poor. And don't forget that was last year, September time. Uh, we are now some six months on and I'm sure those statistics won't have improved. Today, we're going to talk about mental health and well-being. And joining me to discuss this very relevant topic is Aileen Evans, Chief Executive Officer of the Grand Union Housing Group and the current president of the Chartered Institute of Housing, the professional body for those who work in the housing sector. Aileen is a qualified coach and NLP master practitioner with a strong interest in understanding healthy organizational cultures and the impact on performance. Aileen has long had an interest in mental health and is using her Chartered Institute of Housing Presidency to talk about it and raise awareness of part of, as part of her presidential campaign. And she's working with the mental health charity Mind to provide a guide for housing organizations on creating mentally healthy organizations and has set a fundraising target of £50,000 to support Mind this year. In line with this, we are actively taking contributions for Mind today and invite you to support the cause of mental health by submitting a donation. You can do so using the link provided on your screen in the comments section. Remember, every little helps. Also remember, if you like Facebook streams and want to spread the word, 
and I'm sure you do, be sure to share today's live stream. You can do that by clicking the share button in the top corner of your screen. The more the merrier. So just to remind you, if you're just joining us, welcome to our live stream, Talk to Internal Audit. And today's session is about mental health and well-being, a challenge that is facing us all to a greater or lesser extent as we continue to work remotely, often with little or no social interaction throughout the day. Our guest speaker today, as I've already mentioned, is Aileen Evans, CEO for Grand Union Housing Group, a qualified coach and NLP master practitioner. So without further ado, may I please welcome Aileen, our guest today. Over to you, Aileen. Thank you uh, very much uh, for having me. It's a complete privilege um, to be able to talk to you today. I'm going to be sharing some quite personal uh, reflections uh, around my own uh, mental health, that of my family, uh, but then talking about uh, some of the things that as organisations um, we can do about it. So if this triggers anything uh, in you, then don't be worried about sort of going for a walk and um, having a uh, uh, having a break from the uh, having a break from the screen. So I want to start by asking you a question. Um, what do you think a person when we when we think about mental health, what is it that is the image that comes into your minds? Um, so if you ask Google that question, what Google tells us is it's this. It's somebody with their head in their hands. It's somebody who is obviously sad. It's somebody who is obviously uh, suffering and struggling. Actually, let me tell you that a person who uh, encounters mental health challenge looks like this, looks like me, um, looks like my father, looks like my husband. Uh, and and I think that I think is the the the, the big message really to, to get across is that we don't uh, often know uh, what's going on for people and what it is that is um, th that is helping them or not helping them and causing them some challenges in their life. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my um, personal story. Uh, my father, I grew up in a, in a home with a father who was depressed for all of my life. Um, he was medicated latterly, but it was in the years when you didn't talk about how you felt. In fact, I grew up in a home with absolutely no language for feelings at all. Um, so I, I grew up not being able to talk about how I felt. Um, my dad's best friend, my absolutely wonderful um, and very funny life and soul of the party, Uncle Ivan, Took his own life when I was five. My dad really never got over that uh, and he didn't talk about my uncle Ivan um, or how we felt about uncle Ivan's death uh, following that. Um, my dad a attempted, uh, made an attempt on his own life when I was 15. Uh, but the broader impacts of that uh, on us were that he we never knew what sort of father we were going home to. We didn't know whether or not we were going home to our withdrawn, um, upset, angry, frustrated uh, uh, dad or our happy, kind, playful, funny, articulate, uh, helping us with homework dad. Uh, and that uncertainty bred an anxiety in me that actually it took me years to understand where it came from. Um, that was quite difficult um, to live with. It had a similar impact on my siblings, probably even more so on my sister. Um, so, so mental health of, of individuals has a much broader impact than just those people who are experiencing those challenges. It, it, it impacts on whole families. And so we fast forward a little bit then to my uh, lovely husband who um, grew up I guess in similar circumstances grew up with a parent uh, who uh, was qu quite clearly uh, unwell for most of his life but didn't seek any help for it uh, had a, um, a again not an ability to talk about feelings 
not an um, ability to seek help or think about what it was that um, uh, that was troubling them that they can go that they could seek some support with and so if we um, uh, so we were from similar backgrounds I think his mental health though I think was was much more fragile than mine for periods of time not that we were in any sort of competition about this um, and he his his um, the, the main part of his uh, anxiety and uh, depression quite severe anxiety and depression centered around work quite a, a lot of the time um, and we kind of managed it we would we would um, you know we would we would acknowledge it ourselves but he didn't sort of seek any support from it until again he got into crisis um, and that crisis uh, was that when my twins who were now 13 were five years old uh, my husband telephoned me from the railway station having cycled there to get the train to work to say Aileen I don't know whether or not to get on this train or jump in front of it um, he had planned his suicide he knew that he um, he knew how he, uh, he uh, was going to end his life. He, uh, am I, and he would acknowledge now that he had so much to live for, but he could not see, he was completely uh, closed in, um, uh, in this world that was desperately, desperately unhappy for him. He'd had a new boss. Uh, the new boss didn't really understand his role in the business or what he he bought to the business and he um, uh, and Mark wasn't very good at and um, he's loads better now but he wasn't very good at saying when he was unhappy about something so he would just take on stuff and take on stuff and take on stuff until there came a point where he just couldn't cope anymore and he felt he had no release um, and so his release was to um, uh, was to jump in front of a train um, or he felt that that was what it, it was. Um, so my response to that was, well, um, so you, you do some really, really kind of odd things in those circumstances. I said to him, so, so where's your bike? And he said, it's in the bike store. I said, well, go and get your bike and I'll come and fetch you. He said, we won't fit it in the car. I said, we'll manage. We'll fit the bike in the car. So I went and fetched him. We got his bike in the car, brought him home. He's not worked uh, in an organisation since then because actually he's been... Uh, he he was too ill. Uh, we subsequently made decisions about our lives that um, have enabled him uh, not to work. And I know we've been really very lucky to be able to do that. So he um, he had a great GP, a really, really good GP. Uh, we had some private medical insurance through his work uh, and were at, we were able to see an extremely uh, good psychologist. And we were lucky enough to be able to afford the counselling he needed, the counselling and the talking therapy he needed for about two years um, after that point. So if we think about then, uh, so if we move on and it feels quite selfish moving on to the impact on me, but what I've learned is if I, I want to be there for other people, then I absolutely need to take care um, of myself. And I hadn't quite got that when Mark was first ill. Um, but we... Uh, I, I felt I was trying to hold it all together. I got five-year-old twins. I was managing director of a housing association with a 40 million pound turnover. Uh, I had a responsible uh, job and I had a husband who then rather like my dad, although slightly different, I didn't know what it was gonna be like when I got home or even if he was gonna be there when I got home. Um, and so we were, we were, we lived like that actually for, um, for about a year until he started to kind of come out of, of this, uh, he would call it a tunnel um, that he was in. It was a very dark um, time for him. Um, and so I had a great boss, a really, really lovely boss. Uh, and uh, eventually when I told him, I felt very shameful about it, that this was happening to me um, because I felt I should be able to cope. Well, you know, think about it. A suicidal husband, the child of a suicidal father, five-year-old twins, a responsible job. Do you know what? It's not It's not surprising that people don't cope in those circumstances. Um, and so I sought some uh, support. Um, seeking that support actually was, 
uh, was a lifesaver. It was a lifesaver actually for all of us. It enabled me to keep well and cope. It enabled, uh, and it gave me that time where I could absolutely focus on myself and talk about me and how I was feeling. I didn't have to take it home. I didn't have to uh, take it into work, although I could have done if I'd have wanted to. Um, and so, so there was that, that huge impact and I had some therapy. I also learned through that process that I hadn't properly dealt with the death of my mother. Uh, my mother and I were very close and she, was, she died in 2002 um uh, so it's nearly 20 years now goodness um and uh, i didn't um i didn't uh understand actually what impact not dealing with that on on uh, had had on me because again i thought well you know people die all the time you pull yourself together you get back to work you carry on um uh, actually wrong uh, you don't do that at all that's the that's that's the least healthy thing um for you to do so um, we'd got through all of that and then uh, the menopause struck. Well, do you know what? We don't talk enough about the menopause. Um, the menopause did my head in, uh, really. I, I, it had a profound impact on me. But first of all, actually, because I didn't understand what was happening. Um, so I, I became Mrs. Angry. I, I would, I'm a sunny, happy, positive, um, uh, forward thinking, uh, chirpy, uh, glass quite definitely half full person. Actually, I just wanted to yell and scream at, uh, at people and, and swear at them and say, well, yeah, what are you doing that for? It was all very, uh, and I couldn't understand where that person had come from. I became very muddle headed. Um, so, you know, people would walk up to me. I think I know you. I know you really, really well. I wish I could remember your name. I have no clue. Uh, so that happened all the time. It was, you know, my memory, I felt I lost quite a bit of my sharpness um, and my ability to make connections and that stuff that I'd, you know, always felt were, um, was, was, was part of me were, went missing, it went AWOL. But the big impact it had on me was around um, confidence. Um, couldn't get behind the wheel of a car. Uh, to drive the five miles to work. Now, I had happily bunged my kids in the back of a car and, and driven down to France, not, you know, not, not at all worried, but I became really very nervous about driving um, anywhere. And so, um, uh, so I, you know, I didn't drive long distances. I didn't want to drive at night. I, and it was because I didn't, again, understand where it had come from. Um, uh, uh, I went to the doctor and uh, explained this and he said, let me just give you a blood test because th this might be the menopause. And it was the, indeed, the, um, the perimenopause. Um, and if we think, so you alluded to uh, suicides earlier, um, Liz, actually, if we think the largest number of women who commit suicide do so in that perimenopause period, um, that is, uh, and I can understand that because actually that's really confusing. So what, what would it be like if as organisations we talked about that? We talked about this being normal. We talked about these odd peculiar feelings that you were having um, uh, being, uh, being normal. Do you know what people, women would not feel alone? So I often say that 52% of us uh, will um, physically experience the symptoms of menopause. Actually, it will impact upon 100% of us in some way. Um, I, I spoke uh, somewhere in the northeast a little while ago, um, and I got a, a, and I talked about the menopause. I got a message from somebody on the way back uh, saying, uh, "We've had a woman in our team behaving really, really oddly." Um, we've been uh, really concerned and we were about to take disciplinary action and actually your take, uh, talk has made us realise that it could be the menopause and that actually uh, three months down the line they got in, in touch with me, it was. Um, so it will have impacts in all sorts of ways that I think we need to um, understand. So then going back to talking about feelings um, and being able to talk about how we feel in the menopause or whatever, um, we, uh, I grew up with no language for feelings. Um, when I first started counselling and coaching, my coach gave me a bit of paper with feelings words on so I could learn to describe and articulate how I was feeling. And the feeling is an unmet need. 
a feeling is something that, well, okay, so why am I feeling that? I need to go and do something about that. Um, why am I feeling anxious about that? Oh, right, I, so if I do that and that and that, or I seek this sort of help, um, it, you know, they are about those unmet needs. Um, and so I have made it my mission uh, to talk to my children about how I feel, because actually I don't want my children to grow up uh, not being able to articulate how they felt for um, 30, 40 years, which is what happened uh, what happened to me. Uh, if we want to grow mentally healthy adults, actually we've got to start growing mentally healthy um, children and giving them that language for feelings. Um, and, and I do it in an age appropriate way. I don't make them think the sky's falling in. Well, yeah, mummy is a bit stressed. She's stressed because this, this and this, but actually I'll do that and that and it'll be better tomorrow. Um, so it is, you know, finding ways. And now my, um, we had an issue with school the other day and the teacher said, God, you know, I really think Imogen's wonderful because she tells me exactly how she feel and feels. And I'm thinking, bravo, actually I've done something right because I want her to be able to go on doing that because that will help her be uh, mentally healthy. So as you mentioned, Elizabeth, um, one in four of us, uh, will be experiencing a mental health challenge at any one time. Let me put that into some sort of perspective for you. That's 25% of your family, 25% of your work colleagues, 25% of your mates. Uh, when I did this, when I used to do this at posh dinners in the days before COVID, I used to say it's 25% or two people or three people sitting at your table. Um, that's how big it is. Uh, Office for National Statistics tells us that 69% of us have had some sort of COVID related uh, anxiety in the data that they released just before uh, Christmas. That's massive. And after we think about coming out of this pandemic and we're thinking, oh God, what a relief, life will return to normal. There will be a whole plethora of um, consequences from this post-traumatic stress disorder, all of those people in the NHS who have just kept going and kept going and kept going um, under some horrendous circumstances. You know, this isn't the end of, uh, this isn't the end of this. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you is that, you know, I work for a housing association, maintenance and construction are um, trades that are uh, allied to us. We build 400 homes a year. We spend about 20 million quid on building homes, maintaining homes and uh, repairing them. Two men a day, two men a day uh, in construction take their own lives. Now, if that was two men a day having accidents on building sites, the health and safety executive would be all over us quite rightly. And yet we have two men a day in construction taking their uh, own lives. Suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45. Um, that, is, that is shocking. Uh, and then if we move on to thinking about our, uh, our absence, 44% of absence from work nationally is mental health related. Um, so that's the biggest single reason for absence from work. Um, so it really is time uh, we dealt with it. It cost the economy billions. I can't remember how many billions, but it's a huge amount. In Grand Union, the year before last, 34% of our staff absence was mental health related. That cost £115,000. But that's not just about money, is it? It's about every pound of that is misery. That's misery. Um, that's a consequential impact on people like I had. Um, and so that's why taking our own mental health seriously and taking that of our colleagues seriously and as organisations taking that seriously um, is, is a necessity. It's not a, it's not a nice to have, um, it's a necessity. So I'd invite you to do something now. I'd invite you to open a Google window and type in the words anxiety due to. And then you'll get that drop down, won't you, of all of those things that it thinks you want to search for. Um, so I do that pretty regularly, actually, because I, I update what I, I talk about. So the first two um, recently have been anxiety due to COVID and anxiety due to lockdown. But actually, what you'll then find in that drop down is anxiety due to work, anxiety due to divorce, anxiety due to 
uh, separation, anxiety due to uh, money, anxiety due to menopause, lack of control, uncertainty, bereavement, lack of sleep. There are all those reasons that existed pre-COVID when we had a mental health crisis before COVID um, that, were, that were, we're not dealing with, uh, we're not dealing with um, appropriately. So COVID has given us some anxiety, but goodness me, it's not the only um, thing that's done that. And then if we think about how uh, we have lived, um, our homes are supposed to be our castles, aren't they? Well, there's those who are badly housed, who have not, who've had to work from home, or uh, or we've had, we've got a thousand more universal credit claimants at Grand Union than we had at the start of the pandemic. Um, there's been a rise in universal credit claimants of I can't remember, about forty or fifty percent, massive. Um, again, each pound of that, each one of those is misery. Um, but our homes now are our workplaces. So our homes used to be our havens, didn't they? And they, we came home to them. Um, I've got a friend whose desk is in his hall. He said, every time I walk in my front door, I think about work. Um, so suddenly we've got this collision between our private lives, uh, our home life and our work life. And I always say there is no such thing as work life balance. There is only life. And I think this pandemic has really brought it home for us that there is only life. Um, and so uh, but also then if you consider the number of people who have started their careers uh, whilst in lockdown, probably from a tea tray in their bedroom or um, a uh, kitchen table when you've got children running um, around you because we've been homeschooling at the same time, which has given um, added pressures. Um, so I, I, what I hope for coming out of uh, the pandemic um, is that we we find a way to achieve that balance. I'm appalled by those people who say, well, we're just going to shut the office and everybody can work from home. Um, actually, people need space to collaborate. They need space to be with other people. If you think about what you've missed, you've missed those people who have, um, you've, you've missed hugs, you've missed chats, you've missed going for a coffee with someone or the spontaneity of going out for a pizza and being in a restaurant with other people or all of that sort of stuff. So we have to find a way, I think, to make sure that we value that social interaction as much as we do um, saving money on our office costs. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, Dolly Parton. Um, I think she has some most wonderful life lessons. Um, she says, uh, find out who you are uh, and, uh, and do more of it. Uh, but one of the things that, that you, you take maybe from the film Nine to Five, I'm showing my age here, aren't I? Um, that, that actually working life isn't nine to five anymore. Um, and we've had to actively stop people. I've had our IT director say, tell me you're still on the system. You know, and if they're, we've had to stop people working um, because they're, because work is now at home, there is that stuff then that says you should be doing that all the time or you're thinking about it all the time. So achieving proper balance in our lives, not a work life balance, but balance um, across our lives, uh, I think is a, is a uh, fundamentally important um, thing for us because you can't pour from an empty cup. It is not possible to pour from an empty cup. So I'm going to talk ab about some of the things that we've been doing in the Chartered Institute of Housing um, that, that aren't actually about housing. They're about people and they're about wellness. Um, because I, I'm a great, uh, I, one of the big things I learned when I did my MBA was if you see good practice, pinch it. So I think we've done some good practice stuff. So I'm going to give it to you to pinch. Uh, so it's on the Charlton Institute of Housing website on the Shine a Light page. It's also on the, uh, on the Grand Union's website and it's on Mind's website. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about uh, those, uh, those uh, pieces of work that we've done and what some of the findings have, have been coming out of that. Because I think that what mental health needs um, is more sunlight, you know, more days like today where we are talking about it uh, openly, more candor and more unashamed conversation, really. Um, more, more uh, I, you know, I don't want anybody to feel the way I felt when Mark was first ill and I thought, well, I should be able to cope with all of this. 
you know, it's shameful not being able to cope with all that. I'm a coper. Um, uh, you know, pull yourself together, Aileen. I, I, actually, you don't need to feel ashamed about that because one in four of us are experiencing it uh, at any one time. Uh, and I think the bravest thing I ever did was to ask for help. Um, and the bravest thing that, that you will do if, if you're in this situation is to ask for help too. But my goodness, it, it has helped me um, be able to do this and be able to talk about some quite difficult stuff. Um, because I recognise, I think if I'd have heard somebody like me or Rob Stevenson, who runs um, a, an organisation called Outside, Inside Out Who Lives With Bipolar, I heard him speak about his... Um, uh, his challenges and I thought well actually if he can do it I can do it but it made it it made it all right so you make it all right not just for yourself but you make it all right for other people so I think as employers uh, and as people we have a responsibility to understand that mental health is our um, is our business and in the CIH we've done um, three pieces of work which I say are eminently pinchable uh, and equally applicable to uh, in internal audit. We work with uh, MIND to produce a commitment guide. Uh, that commitment guide, uh, it was for the housing sector. Uh, and we are, uh, I, was, I was quite determined at the end of my presidency that I would leave a legacy. You know, it's a great privilege to be elected by your peers to do this. Um, and it's a great privilege to be able to talk about things that you're passionate about, that you care about. Uh, for a whole year or actually a year and a bit um, uh, and raise some money for your causes um, and so that deserves that I do something in return I think and um, so we worked with mine to develop this commitment guide there are other commitment guides out there there's one for sport uh, and there is one there's a toolkit called building better Be better mental health for the construction industry um, but the uh, we developed the mental uh, health at work commitment guide and it contains six fairly um, standard and not difficult principles. First of all, it's about opening up and having a conversation where you can create a climate in which you can implement the principles. But, but then after you've done that, none of this stuff need be difficult or expensive. Um, so it, the commitment guide invites employers to sign up to six commitments. Uh, one, about prioritizing mental health. So we talk about diversity, we talk about belonging, we talk about mental health, we talk about um, a whole range of really important issues, but fundamentally um, uh, creating a mental health, uh, a mentally healthy culture is part of who we are at Grand Union, it's part of our DNA. Um, so it's a clear priority from the top down. One of our uh, board members is a mental health first aider, another blogged on our intranet uh, hugely bravely about the day he had a breakdown and couldn't go back to work. Um, so we openly, um, we openly talk uh, about that and that has some um, uh, very moving and humbling manifestations, but it also has a massive impact and I know that actually if people are feeling unhappy um, and, uh, and are struggling with something, I know that they know that there are places, there are a number of places that they can go uh, within Grand Union or outside of it actually that we will support uh, in, order to get, uh, in order to get help. Um, we've also uh, designed our work culture. So our, our second commitment is about designing our work and culture to drive positive mental health. We don't expect a long hours uh, culture, which is why I'll say to the IT director, kick them out if they're still on the system. I don't want them doing that. That's not, we don't expect that at Grand Union. You know, I don't, I've, you know, worked previously in an organisation where I get an email from the chief exec at six o'clock in the morning and wonder why he hadn't had a reply at half past. Um, you know, we, we, we don't expect that. Um, but also, I think coming out of the pandemic and all this wonderful technology we've learned to use in double quick time, there are some wonderful, wonderful opportunities in that to help us drive um, that uh, work and culture. So if you think about, we did some analysis and some of the lowest paid jobs in our organization 
uh, and we're not a particularly low pay employer, but, but some of the lowest paid jobs were also the, sometimes the most boring. So scanning deed packets uh, when we built new properties so that we could get them into charge uh, is one. Scanning gas and electricity, uh, electrical test certificates uh, is another job. Actually, we use robotic processing um, automation to do that now. So we have a robot do that. The robot spits out the gas certificate that says you need to go and look at this one because all these fields aren't, aren't right. But, but, but generally, they're scanned by a robot. Um, uh, so we had a deep cynicism about uh, robotics and uh, artificial intelligence at Grand Union until people saw the scanning deep packets and scanning. And, and people would say, so can I have that bit next? You know, can you come and do my bit next because I've got this that can be scanned or we've got a robot we can so so that gives us a wonderful opportunity to drive less boring and more um uh more, more uh, jobs where people feel that they can add more value um and that's not to say that those who did scan deed packets or or uh uh, certificates in our organization were valued any less of course they weren't they were doing an absolutely essential job but goodness me you know we we could have found the more interesting things to do and we have now um promoting a, a, an open culture around mental health um I, I talk about the in the way i'm talking to you now i talk about my mental health and mental health uh, in a range of ways at grand union and i've been doing it around the country in housing organisations uh, and uh, and for other and construction some construction companies because I want to start a conversation and sometimes it's easier to ask somebody like me from outside to come and start your conversation because then that prompts the conversation in in your organisation so promoting um, promoting that open culture so I'll I'll use uh, something called Form Score. Uh, I'll send the link so that you can include it in the comments. Uh, it, it's a series of 10 questions that you can ask yourself or you can mark yourself out of 10 uh, for each of them. It's how am I worried about finances? Have, have I slept well? Have I exercised? Uh, have I, uh, how connected do I feel motivation? So you measure each of those out of 10, you get yourself a score out of 10. I share that. I share that either in a video or on a blog and invariably what I get is people piling in saying well I'm nine out of ten I'm Mrs positive today or one one day we had it's I'm a two out of ten I need help um so there that and actually we did help that that person that person was working in a frontline job uh with people who were in crisis when she was in crisis herself uh, so we moved her to another job. We moved her to another job for six months. We paid for some counselling. We gave her some support. She got herself well. Um, and she's now back doing what she loves, having having sort of through her issues. But it was the, I'm a two out of ten, I need help. Um, so if I make myself vulnerable by telling people how I feel, other people will feel safe in doing that. Um, so our fourth commitment is around increasing organisational confidence and capability. Uh, talking about it, people knowing where to go, knowing that they can talk about it, knowing that if they do talk about it, they'll be help and support and not other um, uh, undesirable consequences is a is a um, uh, is something I think that that people value. So it, it's um, uh, so we've sought actively to do that as part of this, provided mental health tools and support. So. Um, one of the best things we did is we partnered with an organization called CFED, which is the Center for Financial Education. Um, the, it's as cheap as chips, it's one pound per employee for month, per month, and they will advise on the best broadband, how to restructure your debts, whether or not you need a mortgage, all of those sorts of things, because we found that actually we're in an area of high housing costs, for example, people were really worried. Um, that so it's not just things that have a mental health label it is stuff like that that practically supports people to worry less um if anybody had have said those two words to me when i was about 20 i would have had a much better life worry less aileen worry less um but actually what we are trying to do at grand union is help people uh, worry less uh, we also have mental health first aiders we provide fresh fresh fruit or we did when we had an office open um we've done all sorts of things through lockdown we've done daft quizzes we've done um 
uh, through the keyhole, who lives in a house like this, that's been hilarious. Um, all sorts of things. Um, and we do mindfulness, we have uh, yoga, we have a massage therapist come in when the office is open, who does back and neck massages. I don't know if you've ever had one of those. It's, it's absolutely wonderful for my mental health, um, feeling physically better as a result of having not a pain in the neck. Um, and so, um, you know, that those sorts of things that enable us to, uh, that they are the sorts of things that enable us to drive positive mental health. They're not, as I say, just about having uh, mental health in the uh, title. Um, and the final thing uh, that we have done is that we are accountable. So uh, we produce the figures that say 34% uh, of our staff, uh, staff absence was mental health related. We break that down. Actually, it's not all, uh, there were two cases of work related stress uh, in that, but the rest of it was life. The rest of it was bereavement. Um, uh, problems with children, uh, relationship breakdown, the rest of it was just life. Um, and so we are in incredibly transparent about our reporting um, about that now. I think as a nation, we are getting better around diversity and gender reporting. Uh, for me, mental health reporting is the next big, uh, is the next big thing. So that's that guide. Sorry, I went on about that. But actually, I think it's a really important guide and it's dead simple so nick it adapt it for your organizations and do it because it's brilliant the the never want to waste a good pandemic our second piece of work um uh we did a survey so the incoming president of the chartered institute of housing is a woman called professor joe richardson um who, who as her name would suggest is an academic and at de montfort university they did a study uh for us we surveyed um through the covid crisis we surveyed uh, young people working in housing um a particular cohort of young people called uh, from something called the gem program which is a, a talent uh, a, a young talent program that we run in housing. Um, we surveyed chief executives, we, we surveyed frontline staff and chief execs of um, homeless charities. Uh, we found some really surprising stuff. That was a proper academic study. So the main thing goes to about 44 pages. The exec summary is a lot shorter and a bit more readable, um, but that has some stark stuff in it. So for example, for young people, many respondents uh, said that there was no clear career path for them and that was actually causing them some anxiety. We didn't actually expect that to come out and that's been some real big learning for us at the CIH about how we can help create that career path. Um, so I, I would echo with the, this next statement, um, uh, housing chief execs um, felt a deep sense of responsibility for their staff but at the same time we have personal caring responsibilities and concerns. And so, I mean, I, I don't feel I got up from my computer between June and May last year. I was uh, not June, uh, January and May last year. I was knackered, completely exhausted. My kids were being homeschooled. We'd invaded my husband's space because he's used to sort of doing lots of DIY and uh, music and, and uh, uh, other bits and pieces. Um, and, I, you know, I was working in this environment that I had to get used to quite quickly, where I was divorced from the people that I would bounce off. We found other ways to bounce. But so um, so there was a so I, I, I was worried. I, I was uh, I was worried about how it would all pan out. I was worried about the team um, and I knew there was some worry in, in amongst the team themselves about how they were doing in particular people who lived alone I was very um, we were very concerned about um, there was the other thing we found there, there was a disconnect between frontline staff and chief execs um, so frontline frontline workers wanted more support and recognition and gratitude um, and chief execs thought that that was what they were doing so we changed our question we changed our question at um, Grand Union, rather than say, we are giving you all this support and listing it, we said, how is it you would like us to support you? What is it you would like us to do? Um, we made a point of doing more drop-ins and saying thank you. 
um, to individuals. We have this scheme called Bonusly and uh, our, our, on our intranet where you can give shout outs to people. Exec uh, and leadership team were much more visible on that. So they were doing that much more, uh, much more publicly. So that's that bit of, um, uh, that's that bit of uh, work. Um, and then the third bit of work was, I, I can remember sitting in our housing team a few years ago now, and somebody said to me, has anybody got the hoarding spreadsheet open? Hoarding, I hate spreadsheets anyway. I, I mean, I would disconnect Excel if I could. I realise that's not something to say to uh, or, or auditors, but, um, but I, so, so tell me about the hoarding spreadsheet. We were dealing with 40 cases of hoarding. Hoarding is symptomatic of really poor mental health. And in the context of this post grandfather world, hoarding is really, really dangerous. Um, and so landlords have been evicting people that have been hoarding, uh, where they've been doing it in tower blocks because they can't afford to take the risk that if there's a fire um, in, in that block, the, the, the um, contents, to, uh, contents of a hoarded flat will accelerate um, the, the uh, transmission of the fire. Um, and so, but hoarding is symptomatic of poor mental health. So there was that, and there was thinking, all right, okay, so there'll be, there'll be instances where the poor mental health of our tenants and customers will impact on the poor mental, will, will have an impact on, on poor mental health or causing mental health challenges for our staff. Um, and, and in the context, I think, of the rowing back of the state, and it's been more difficult to access certainly community mental health services, um, we, uh, it, it, it has been, uh, I, I wanted to put something very simple in place that would help people think about how they could communicate whilst not being mental health workers, whilst being housing professionals, how they could communicate uh, in ways that would help interaction with their tenants rather than antagonise it. And, and there's some coaching principles in that guide about, about how we write, um, how we speak, uh, 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 but only really very simple. So I had to accept that we're not uh, that we're not housing um, that, that we're not mental health professionals, and I'm not trying to turn us into mental health professionals. Um, and so I'm just going to um, finish up now with a, a, a few things that um, uh, around spotting the signs for yourself and others, and also tell you about some things that I do to keep well. You will find your own things to help keep you well. There is that the Dolly Parton, you know, find out who you are and do more of it. Well, it's find out what you love and and do more of that. I think um, it is a it is a very useful um, principle to have. But, you know, we've all had mates, haven't we, where they've or, or we've been in situations where you think, do you know what, they're a bit agitated and restless. What's what's going on there or not wanting to talk? The people who don't want to turn the cameras on. Is there an issue behind that? Feeling tearful. I know when I get really tired and throughout my, the early part of the menopause when I couldn't sleep properly and I'm not a great sleeper now. God, I would get really, really weepy. I would just want to cry all the time. And that wasn't. So I was either Mrs. Angry or I was in tears. Um, so uh, and there, there are those people. So flagship, for example, run a, a uh, men's mental health group and they have quite a lot of focus on alcohol. So turning to alcohol um, or, or drugs to cope with feelings. Now, you won't always know about that, but you can notice that there's a change in somebody. Um, not replying to messages uh, or being a bit distant, it can be a sign. Uh, not wanting to do the things that you usually enjoy. Um, I found new things to enjoy through lockdown that I will be taking with me. My daily exercise, I would no, nobody would ever have... Um, nobody would ever have associated the words daily and exercise with me but actually it's helped keep me really mentally healthy and I'm going to carry on doing it um feeling it hard to cope with everyday stuff I think is is something that we've all had from time to time um and if there's an inability to concentrate linked to that kind of jumpiness uh, and that you can observe in people or yourself then you know it's time to ask yourself why that might be um, we've had a couple of people who uh, have really been unable to complete stuff, who were very good previously, uh, and, and actually they've lived alone. 
they've struggled to be motivated. One of our team uh, said, and when I respond, I, I put my form score up and somebody said, I've had a, I, I'm, I felt really bad last week because I didn't want to go to bed because I didn't want to get up in the morning. Um, and so, you know, being able to um, te have that person say that and tease that out enables us to work to do something to support uh, her with that. Um, but, but if people are forming any new patterns that, that you know, are, aren't, if they're doing things that, that, that aren't, aren't familiar uh, and behaving out of character, that can sometimes be a symptom. So look for those in yourselves, but also look for them in other people. We have this hashtag at um, Grand Union called Ask Twice. Um, so how are you? And how are you really? Um, so how are you? Mm, are you sure you're all right? Because I'm noticing that you probably you're not quite as all right as you could be. Um, so we use hashtag ask twice. Uh, and that is a it's just a really simple thing we can all do because you've got a choice. When somebody says they're all right, you've got a choice to say um, to walk past and say, well, they said they're all right. I don't think they are really, but I haven't got time. Or you can go and say, do you know, I'm yeah, I, I'm a bit worried because I'm not sure you yourself. Is there anything I can do to support? And that second question will often um, be the floodgate that will enable somebody to uh, somebody to open up. Um, I use the app Headspace, but you can use Calm app. Headspace is so much more than a uh, meditation app. It's a coaching app. It's a help change my perspective app. It's a relaxation app. Um, you uh, but there's calm up i know people at work use rain rain to get sleep at night uh, the the sound of rain tumbling uh, on a on a path doesn't do it for me but it does do it for some of my colleagues um the there's a marvelous toolkit on the nhs website called every mind matters with a questionnaire you can fill in um and if you are wondering where to start and thinking about how you can access services then Hub of Hope is a lovely, it's, you can download its little app, you put your postcode in, it tells you where all the voluntary and statutory mental health uh, and support services are in your area. Uh, and it will, I guarantee it will tell you things you didn't know. Um, so I hope through that kind of canter through my world, I have um, shared something that's resonated with you, shared something that, you know, might, might help you, might make you do something differently. Um, and, uh, and if you can support the work of mind, uh, I am very keen um, to uh, try and fund two, possibly three workers for their helpline, um, because their helpline is doing wonderful work. Then I would be hugely, hugely grateful. Uh, and thank you. And I've, I've talked long enough. Um, so I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aileen. Um, really great. And um, I, so much of what you said resonated. I, I can recall my mother when, when I had my first son. Um, well, I've only got one son, but when I had my son, um, and I used to enjoy spending so much time with him and we used to play and do all sorts of things. And she said to me, it's time you learned to worry more. And I wish I'd ignored her <laughs> because I've spent my life worrying about all sorts of things. Um, but it was a different generation then. That's also, the point. Yeah. I also heard um, uh, an audit committee chairman say the other day, um, Liz, are we, um, are we working at home or are we sleeping at work? And I think for an awful lot of our people, I think sleeping at work is probably what it felt like over the last year. Um, so a lot of, as I say, a lot of what you said really resonated and gave me, and I hope the people who are listening today, lots of things to think about and reflect on. So in conclusion, could I just remind you, if you've literally just joined us, um, welcome to the live stream. And today's session has been around mental health and well-being, a challenge that faces all of us in um, different ways. Today we heard from Aileen Evans, Chief Exec for Grand Union Housing Group, who's a qualified coach and NLP Master Practitioner. And as she's spoken about 
mental health, the issues that face us now, from personal experience, and perhaps more importantly, what we can do to identify some of these issues if, if we are and if we have them and we're not facing them, and also what we can perhaps do to mitigate them. So may I say a huge thank you to Aileen for joining me today and for sharing her thoughts with us. I think there's lots of things for us to reflect on based on, on what she share, uh, said and things that we can share with our friends, our family, and also our internal audit colleagues. And may I say um, and remind you what I said at the beginning, if today's session has helped you or perhaps given you the courage to talk about mental health, may I ask you to think about donating to MIND so they can help others, perhaps your friends. The details are in the comments box, so please have a look. The live stream is available afterwards for those of your friends or colleagues who may have missed the live version on our, the Institute's Facebook page. And may I ask you, please, to follow all the exciting things the Institute is doing on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. As a member, you have access to the latest edition of our Audit and Risk magazine, which is now available on our website. And the topics included in this edition are um, around cybercrime, corruption. There's an interview um, with the UK's new president, um, president of the Institute, not Boris, um, some of the, uh, an interview and, and an article about what I wish I'd known when I joined internal audit. There's an update on the FS code and there is um, some information around the World Economic Forum's global risk report for 2021. The cybersecurity articles featured in the magazine coincide with our newly launched cybersecurity report, which I'm sure you've already read. There's a hint there. If not, you can find it um, on the policy and research section of our website. We have um, a local authority internal audit forum on the 24th of March, where the topic is cybersecurity this month. I'm happy, as you all know, that are familiar with these sessions to take questions via email at liz.sandwith at iia.org.uk. And as we move forward into the new future, please don't forget to look out for Talk to Internal Audit. Some of what we published in 2020, we're publishing on YouTube. And of course, as we faced 2021 head on, we will continue to share with you our thoughts regarding specific challenges, along with input from colleagues, members, and guests. If you have any specific topics you would like us to cover, please share your thoughts in the comments box. And remember, please talk to Internal Audit because the Institute is listening. Thank you, stay safe, goodbye.